the book of the prophet Isaiah. I know my Jewish friends will be shaking their heads. At the as Americans, we always say Isaiah. I think that's uh, uh, that plight probably hits most of us. So I won't try to do it correctly because I'm sure I'm not doing it correctly enough. So it's Isaiah for all of us. This is the first session, and uh, it's just an introductory session and just the first chapter tonight. And so the name itself, Isaiah, Yorivave is salvation, is what the word apparently actually means. Now we're also going to draw, we'll continue to use the King James Version as sort of our baseline. But we're going to do something a little different here for a number of reasons. We're going to draw on the International Standard Version Bible. It's just being released now. Uh, the ISV, as it's called. It, it, uh, the, uh, it's primary, it teaches <coughs> the Dead Sea Scrolls as the primary text. It's the only translation that's ever done that. And uh, using the great Isaiah scroll uh, as the base text. And uh, the Masoretic text and the Septuagint and the Syrian and, and Targum, all those are, are compared as variants as most translations do attempt to do. And, uh, but we also are blessed by having a specific translation by Dr. Peter Flint himself, who is acknowledged as the, the world expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, Dr. Flint and Dr. Welty, uh, who are the uh, very, very active in the ISV program. And, uh, they, uh, th so, and we ha also have direct personal access to them that help us with some of the difficult passages. So in addition to the International Standard Version, we obviously, by doing that, we're leaning primarily on the Dead Sea Scrolls, the DSS it's called, that was found in 1947 in Cave 1. And that's sometimes called the Great Scroll, the Great Isaiah Scroll. And uh, there's actually a second Isaiah Scroll, but not as complete as the first one. And uh, so we have a proprietary translation in the, from the Paleo-Hebrew into English by Dr. Flint that we're drawing on. But we also will, of course, lean on the Septuagint, and on the Masoretic text, which is uh, most, most uh, translations use as primary. So that's the perspective that we'll be drawing on as we go through this incredible book. Now, Isaiah is a very uh, unusual guy. He was the son of Amos, not Amos the prophet, a different Amos, if you will. Both the first and last letters of the name are different in the Hebrew, by the way. Uh, he, we, we believe he may be the brother of Amaziah, who was Uzziah, the, the father of the king, if you will which makes, if that's correct, then Isaiah is actually of royal blood. He's actually uh, uh, of royal rank, if you will. And so he had direct access to the king, we discover, when we get to chapter 7. He had intimacy with the high priest. Uh, he's going to be distinctive, by the way, in the sense that he is actually has a court position as a prophet. Prior to him, prophets were for a person, Nathan, for David, and so forth. But uh, 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 Isaiah really was, had, had royal standing before the king in a very unique way, as we'll draw on. Uh, so Jerusalem, of course, was his home, and he was the court preacher, if you will. He apparently was martyred, and the tradition is that he was killed by King Manasseh, who apparently cut him in half with a wooden saw. And uh, that's not only in the Jewish traditions, but it may be an allusion in, he in the Epistle of the Hebrews, chapter 11, makes an allusion to that. So... Uh, he, had, he was married, had two sons, and uh, they have some pretty wild names. We'll deal with that later, but because they're named uh, symbolically uh, uh, for prophetic reasons. And uh, we'll get into that later as we get into the book. He is acknowledged to be the greatest of the writing prophets. He ministered during the reign of four kings, and uh, that, that included the invasion of the northern kingdom by Assyria. That'll be a big event that we'll be dealing with as it goes forward. Something else that we'll touch on as we go forward here is that all calendars on the planet Earth changed in 701. And there's some evidence that the orbit of the Earth was altered for some reasons, and we'll talk about that when we get into that. So, But Isaiah is the most comprehensive of all the prophets. Uh, he, his span of themes include the creation of the universe all the way through to a creation of a new heavens and a new Earth. So that's a pretty broad span of his writings. No other prophet matches his eloquence. He is an articulate writer, and uh, especially on the glory of God. All the nations of the world are included in his predictions. So we won't be surprised as we run into some very, very contemporary comments. And uh, no other prophet is as focused on God's redemptive work. 
uh, of the Messiah and so forth. Or more, there's no prophet more clearly aware of grace in the Old Testament than uh, uh, Isaiah. Now, his vocabulary is interesting. They measure uh, sometimes vocabulary, the number of different words that the, uh, the writer uses. Ezekiel uses about a little over 1,500. Jeremiah about 1,600. The psalmist collectively a little over 2,000. But uh, Isaiah is almost 2,200. And uh, he compares, in a sense, if you're a student of English, you know that Milton, Dante, and Shakespeare are regarded as having the largest English vocabularies on record. And so, in the, in the, in the Jewish sense, Isaiah would uh, head the list uh, in their domain. So, very articulate guy. He has ver a versatility, his versatility of expression, the brilliance of his imagery, has no rival in the Bible. And it's regarded as the climax of the Hebrew literary art. And he uses epigrams and metaphors, interrogation and dialogue, uh, antithesis and alliteration, and hyperbole and parables. You'll also discover in Isaiah, it's probably incidental to, our, to the, the story, but it's going to be provocative to us to discover encryptions. If you're a student of cryptography, you're aware of some uh, patterns in the Bible. And one occurs in Isaiah chapter 7, and we'll deal with that issue when we get there, but I think that's rather provocative. It's well known uh, to the science of encryption as, as one of the early forms of, of encryption in uh, chapter 7. But we'll also discover another form of something you probably would consider an, an encryption, equidistant letter sequences, and you'll be startled with what is encrypted in Isaiah 53 when we get to the centerpiece of the third section of the book. And so it's poetical, it has rhythmic style, there's examples of that, and uh, the rhythms and, and uh, stylings are very well identified and they're in your notes if you want to go chase those things down. But I want to pause before we get into the book itself to deal with something that is astonishing to me, uh, and that's the fact that, uh, it, well, first of all, uh, you need to know there is a tradition, as I said, that um, Isaiah was sawed in half by King Manasseh. And, uh, but uh, something that has happened, we know for sure, they tried to saw his book in half. So I'm calling the section Sawing Isaiah Asunder. And this is a precious lesson. I should let, anecdotally make a comment here. When I was a teenager, I got very interested in, in the Bible, and I started collecting books, and I'd save my money and buy some commentaries. And I ran it, I, I, and I did this without a lot of knowledge at first. And I picked up some beautiful commentaries, well bound, very modern, very nice, and so forth. And I encountered the sc scholastic tradition that Isaiah really didn't write Isaiah. It was really written by different, two different guys, and so forth. And uh, it's interesting because of that, as I ran into some of that, it tended to cloud my perception of the Bible being inspired by the God uniquely. And it en I entered a period of my life where I didn't, never rejected the Bible. I stayed uh, uh, in, involved in it, but not with the zeal I had before. For probably more than 20 years, I was sort of in the Bibles, but I didn't really have that initial edge that I started with. And because I ran into what, what I'll call today pseudo-scholarship, it sounded very good, and this was one of them, the so-called Deuterisaiah thing. And uh, so, uh, higher criticism, it's called, led to the so-called Deutero-Isaiah belief that there were really two Isaiahs, that chapters 1 through 39 was one Isaiah, and from 40 to the end was I, uh, second Isaiah. In fact, there's even some versions of that, that divides it into three parts, but I'll skip that for now. Two Isaiahs, that really bothered me. That was so widely accepted among seminaries. As I started doing sophisticated reading, I realized it was naive to think that Isaiah wrote Isaiah. And what's amazing, that's in spite of any concrete evidence on that uh, any part of Isaiah ever existed without the other part. And as far back as 200 B.C., the dogma of most scholarship today is that two or more individuals authored Isaiah. You'll find that among those that consider themselves biblically literate. And uh, two Isaiahs. And this perspective arose originally in the deistic climate of the 18th century Europe originally. Gabin McDutterland was one of the first to argue 
for a second author. And he said explicitly that since Isaiah could not have foreseen the fall of Jerusalem, the 70-year captivity, the return of Cyrus, uh, he could not have written those chapters making such claims. In other words, he rejected prophecy. And since Isaiah is so explicit in those prophecies, it obviously couldn't be what it's represented to be. That was the view that emerged from the so-called uh, uh, higher critics of that period. So I stumbled from what I call pseudo-scholarship. And uh, so the idea, whole idea, the tradition says that Isaiah was sawn asunder, and I say that's what's happened to the book. It was sawed in half. Um, and so we're indebted. I have to, I can't summarize quickly how indebted I feel to the Apostle John. Because there is quite a bit of stuff, and I'll share that with you shortly. But um, the, the, uh, the, the Apostle John has a couple of verses that when I encountered and realized what they said, they were a life spring to me. And let's get into that. It's in John chapter 12. And there in John 12, starting about verse 37, John says, But though he had done so many miracles, speaking of Jesus, before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake. Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the Lord, arm of the Lord been revealed? So John is making a comment here that they were in disbelief as Isaiah predicted. And what he's doing here, he's quoting from Isaiah in verse 37. And that may sound, if you recognize that phrase, that's obviously coming from the, the first, the opening line of Isaiah 53. Isaiah, but he's talking, he's quoting from Isaiah the prophet. And uh, so let's move on here. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. And that phrase occurs in Isaiah chapter 6. And the verse that's become dear to me personally is verse 40. Because in verse 40, you see at the end he says, I, I said Isaiah, but in verse 40, therefore they could not believe because that Isaiah said again. You see what John is doing? You, you missed this unless you're watching for it. John is quoting from Isaiah part 2, so to speak. Then he's quoting from part 1, but he connects them with verse 40, that same Isaiah. I believe that's the Holy Spirit just throwing out the window all this baloney that arises out of higher criticism. And uh, that verse, that, that, that Isaiah, that meant so much to me. And I, I remember I was sharing this with Dr. Walter Martin, and he says, Chuck, those were the years their locusts have eaten. I said, well, that's great. What does that do? He says, the Lord's going to give you those years back. And so I feel that my life from th this discovery on was enriched because I didn't waste my time chasing these fool this foolishness that masquerades as scholarship. And that's one reason I wanted, before we even get into Isaiah, throw that out the window. Don't be surprised at the, the, uh, the pseudo-scholarship that you'll encounter on this subject. And so that single verse verifies that that Isaiah said again. But in the meantime, just to arm you a little more fully, there are 61 separated passages that are quoted and referred to 85 times in the New Testament. 23 of those passages are from what I'll call Isaiah 1, the first 39 chapters, and 28 of them are from Isaiah 2, and they're quoted 53 times. So 85 altogether. Isaiah 1 talks about the reign of Christ in the kingdom, talks about the virgin birth in chapter 7. Isaiah talks about the reign of Christ in Isaiah 9, the Jesus' rule over the world in Isaiah 9. Christ is the descendant of David in chapter 11. Christ to be filled with the Spirit in chapter 11. The, Christ to judge with righteousness in chapter 11. And Christ to rule over the nations in chapter 11. How precious those passages are. Let's go to Isaiah part 2, if you want to call it that. Christ to be gentle to the weak in Isaiah 42. Christ to make possible the new covenant in Isaiah 42 and 49. Christ to be a light to the Gentiles and to be worshipped by them is in 42 and 49 and 52 and so forth. 
uh, Christ to be rejected by Israel is described in Isaiah 49 and detailed in 53. In fact, Isaiah 53 summarizes Paul's epistles more succinctly than any of us probably could. Christ to be obedient to God and subject to suffering, Isaiah 50 and of course 53. Christ to be exalted, of course, and Christ to restore Israel and judge the wicked in 61 and so forth. Jesus himself quotes from Isaiah 29 and Mark 7, and he quotes in uh, uh, chapter 42, he quotes from Matthew 12, or you say in Matthew 12, records that quote, and uh, and that's the one we just looked at, and Isaiah referenced in, uh, his Ma- in Matthew 8 by quoting Isaiah 53. So we find Jesus quoting from all parts of Isaiah, if you will. And these are examples that are in your notes, so we'll just move on here. Isaiah is mentioned 21 times by six books in the New Testament as an author. Ten times he's quoted in, mentioned in what I'll call Isaiah 1, because we have Matthew 4, it quotes from Isaiah 9. In Matthew 13, there's a quote from Isaiah 6, 9. In Matthew 15, Isaiah 29, and in Mark 7, uh, from Isaiah 29. We have John uh, 12, the one we looked at shortly ago, and uh, uh, John uh, 41, and again 6, 9. We have Acts 28, quote 6, see 6, 9 is quoted a great deal, by the way, all through. And uh, Romans 9 quotes uh, Isaiah 10, and uh, also Isaiah 1. And so Romans 15 from Isaiah 11 and on it goes. Those are all from the first Isaiah. Now from the second Isaiah we have 11 times there. We have Matthew in chapter 40 and in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, Mark and, uh, we have chapter 42. We have Luke chapter 40. Uh, Luke chapter 4 quotes Isaiah 61 and that's the Christ's mandate when he, in Nazareth. Um, John 1 quotes Isaiah 43, John the Baptist introduction. And we just go right on through here. There's 11 of these where in the New Testament it's quoting from. The point is your New Testament interchanges their quotes from 1 and 2. There is no, there is, it's the same guy is my point. And so six different speakers quote Isaiah. Here's another tally. Christ speaks of it four times. I listed those earlier. Three times from what we call Isaiah 1 and once from Isaiah 2. Matthew quotes uh, from each side. Luke quotes four times from Isaiah 2. John quotes three times, twice from Isaiah 1 and once from... And so the, they're bridging, if we, these six speakers are bridging the, the so-called two parts, what I'm calling here uh, with my tongue in my cheek, Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. So the manuscript evidence, though, is a very strong and it gives important evidence of Jesus' claims to God. Isaiah's writings were completed many centuries before Christ was born, and yet they are completely accurate about his birth. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain more than one complete scroll of this book well before the birth of Christ. And that, uh, it, that was included in the Septuagint translation which it was the er, up until the Dead Sea Scrolls, the earliest version of the Old Testament scriptures, that, and it was translated sometime about 300 years before, Christ, for, before Christ's ministry. And Isaiah is re, uh, presented there in the Septuagint as a single book, not as a split book. And uh, when the Dead Sea Scrolls come along, we discover a complete scroll of Isaiah dated from the second century BC, and it's a single unit. Chapter 39, the end of chapter 39 and the beginning of chapter 40 are one continuous column of text. See, there's no manuscript evidence supporting this nonsense that is embraced by so many seminaries. See, this demonstrates that the scribes who copied the scroll never doubted the singular unity of the book. And I'll also add this. As you understand the book, you'll be overwhelmed by the unity of the book yourself. It's not that big a mystery. And so... See, the, uh, and, and the New Testament authors and the early church qu- quoted both sections and attributed only to one, one Isaiah, as I think I've hammered here a bit. So out of all this, here's something, a guard I want to have you put on yourselves here. Learn to be a critical thinker. Don't confuse, don't, don't, don't uh, first of all, be skeptical of unsupported academic traditions you'll discover that seminaries are full of traditions that are not true. It's astonishing how academia in general, especially in science, not just theology, embraces traditions that are not true. 
And uh, don't mistake sophistication for scholarship. Fancy vocabularies, elaborate equation. No, no. Be a critical thinker. Make Acts 17.11 your litmus test. As you know, for, what, five decades we've had Acts 17.11 as our trademark. Be like the Bereans, in that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with openness of mind, and then search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. That's two parts. And for many, many years I emphasized the second part, search the scripture daily to prove those things to be so. In recent years I realized the tough, that isn't the tough part, the tough part's the first part. Have an open mind with readiness of mind. Set aside your own presuppositions when you go to the biblical text. Receive the word of all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And make your refuge the whole counsel of God. If you have a perception Make sure it stands the test of fitting into the whole fabric, all 66 books, if you will. Well, to give you a quick glimpse of what we're going to get into here, um, we're going to discover the vision of the throne of God. And I, that's the way it's called in the, in, by most commentators. I think he actually was there. I, I don't think it's just a vision, by the way, but we'll get into that in chapter 6. And of course, the virgin birth issue we'll deal with when we get to chapter 7. And incidentally, it's also the chapter where we'll encounter some interesting encryptions that will re reveal a plot behind a, a plot on the king. Chapter 9 will be the Messianic revelation. Then we'll also get an exposure to the origin of Lucifer, w Satan. Is he real? Where did he come from? What's all that about? And we'll even talk a little bit about the Great Pyramid, which may be an illusion in chapter 19. John the Baptist emerges in chapter 40. And chapter 53 is an astonishing chapter for many reasons. That's the suffering death of the Messiah. And uh, we'll see Jesus quote from 61, his mandate when he starts his ministry. And uh, we'll t even when we get to 65 and 66, we'll talk about the millennium and beyond. The millennium itself is a controversial thing, but it's interesting that most of what we know about the millennium does not come from Revelation chapter 20. It comes from Isaiah. 65 and 66. And so we'll get into that one very heavily at that time. But uh, it's interesting, you'll discover that the deity of Christ, the eternity, pre-existence, creatorship, omnipotence, omnipresence, we're, we're, we're indebted to Isaiah for insights into all those things. The incarnation is going to be hit heavily. Uh, the, we're going to discover a lot about his youth when he grew up in Nazareth and then anointed as a servant of the Lord in chapter 11 and how he, God delighted in him. We'll learn a lot about his manner and his kindness. His obedience. This is all described in Isaiah centuries before Jesus was born and, uh, and his message and miracles and so forth. We'll, t we'll learn a lot about his sufferings. You'll learn some things about the sufferings of Christ that you won't find in the New Testament. It goes beyond that. The gathering to exaltation, his rejection by Israel is all laid out in advance. The shame, he's struck, he's bruised, <clears throat> his vicarious death on our behalf, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and the spiritual progeny from all of this, and his high priestly ministry, which many people don't realize, and his future glory, all dealt with by this incredible, articulate, capstone prophet of the Scripture. And as we do all this, we're going to encounter something that may surprise you is that much of what Isaiah is talking about has to do with today. There's a broader relevance than most people realize. See, God had called a special people to represent Him. They had become apostate and failed. That's the real message here. The enemies of God are represented by metaphors of Assyria and Babylon here. God's judgments and his ultimate restoration are depicted and surprisingly relevant to us today. Many of us are very, very sensitive to the fact that we're moving to the, we're in the age of Laodicea. What does that mean? How does Isaiah relate to that? See, most of us have a Greek model of prophecy. We think of predictions and fulfillment. Predictions and fulfillment. The Hebrew model is a little different. The Hebrew model is prophecy is pattern. They see God dealing in patterns. The patterns of the nation are harbingers of Messiah himself, and vice versa. And we're going to see some of that emerge from Isaiah. Now, the design of the book is in three major pieces. The, the session one, 
Division one, if you will, is uh, 35 chapters. The first six are about Judah. Six has the king on the throne, incidentally. Then in Israel. Then it'll deal with eight nations specifically. And then it'll deal with the, the uh, day of Yorivave, the day of the Lord. What is all that about? In fact, chapters 24 through 27 are called by some scholars the little apocalypse. It's like a miniature revelation in a sense. We're going to talk about the six woes that come up on Jerusalem. We're going to discover those six woes are upon us today, very graphically. And then the tribulation millennium we dealt with. That's the first major section of Isaiah. There's a third section that's a big section. Between the two, there's a little one. We'll call it Division Two. It's a parenthetical historical insert, and it's in four parts. In fact, it, it parallels 2 Kings 18 and 2 Chronicles 32. In fact, it looks as if 2 Kings 18 may have been written by Isaiah himself. He was a, a assistant of the king in those days. But chapters 30, the, the next four, those four chapters, 36 is Hezekiah's trouble and deals with the Asian invasion that's forthwith. They, you'll talk about Hezekiah's prayer, very unusual one, and then his illness, and finally his folly. So it's a little four chapter historical insert before we get to the main event, and the main event is Division, uh, uh, division 3. And uh, 40 through 48 is the purpose of peace. 49 to 57 is the prince of peace. And 58 to 66 will be the program of peace. And the highlight of the set Division 3 is chapter 53. Many people call it the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. And you'll discover it's very interesting. It's exactly in the middle. It's preceded by 13 chapters, and there's 13 chapters that follow it. And, uh, and of course, it's bracketed also by a phrase, there is no peace, saith Yorivave, to the wicked. And that's both in front of it and behind it. But that's the peak, that's the pinnacle. And that's really our target, is to prepare ourselves for that third division of this book as we go forward. So with all that as sort of a warm-up, let's take a look at chapter 1, God's case against Judah. In chapter 1, this is the first, this first chapter, by the way, is not an introduction just to this part, it's an introduction to the entire book. Many people miss that. It's about the sinfulness of God's chosen people. The focus tactically is, is of course, Judah and Israel. But I'm going to suggest that most of us here would raise our, if I said, are you and God's chosen people, you'd raise your hand. We, the church is too. And are we sinful? Absolutely, that's the problem. And we're going to see the tender appeals to the Lord. We'll talk about the certainty of coming judgment. And we'll talk about the blessedness of the salvation to come. And uh, so on. So let's just start. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. In the King James, of course, that's where you usually start. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And so... Uh, might point out that this is an introduction to the entire book, not just this section. And so, now Amos, by the way, is not the Amos of Prophet, the book. We have a book called the Book of Amos. That's Amos the Prophet. Amos here, it's, a, it's spelled with different first and last letters in the Hebrew. He may have been the brother of Amaziah, the father of the king, Uzziah, which would make, of course, Isaiah of royal lineage and a cousin. So, now if we switch, we're going to take a look. As we go, we're going to take advantage of the new, the uh, International Standard Version Bible, which is coming out. So let's take a look at this. And uh, it, it reads as follows. This is the record of the vision that Amos' son Isaiah had about Judah and Jerusalem during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, kings of Judah. Small point, you'll notice it doesn't mention Hezekiah. And that's because the Hezekiah thing appears only in the Masoretic text. It looks like it was added by the Masoretes. Interesting. It certainly, he, he, uh, uh, he, uh, Isaiah ministered in the days of Hezekiah, but, but uh, not all the way. But interestingly enough, that's, that's, uh, that's not in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. It's not, and it's a small point, a subtle point, but I just want to point out that there are subtle differences that, that we'll notice as we go, uh, because the ISV is taking advantage of the Dead Sea Scroll perspective. And so, uh, okay. Now the uh, uh, chronology here, King Uzziah, is we're going to discover in chapter 6 that when he dies is when Isaiah gets treated to a throne room of God. So he starts that, he's starting just near the end of Uzziah's um, reign, obviously. He's followed by Jotham, 
He's followed by Ahaz, who's a major loser. <laughs> and we'll talk about that when we get to uh, chapter 7. And uh, then comes Hezekiah. And uh, while he makes, makes mistakes, he's, a, he's considered a good king. But Hezekiah is followed by the worst of the bunch, a guy by the name of Manasseh. And in Manasseh's reign, there was blood border to border. And we just need to understand that he was bad news. And, and by, at least by tradition, it looks like that, uh, that he uh, uh, is the one that martyred uh, Isaiah. And the tradition is that he sawed him in half with a wooden saw. And there's allusion to that in Hebrews 11. So that may have some substance here. But we'll move on here. See, Isaiah may have outlived Hezekiah, strangely enough. And it was, so it's Manasseh that ended it. For, the last dated event is the 14th year of Hezekiah in uh, year 701. And that's when all calendars change for some reason. And, there's, and Hezekiah responded to that. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Some very interesting conjectures come out of that. But uh, it's, of course, the, uh, the, the uh, Jewish tradition that he was put to death during the reign of Manasseh. And that's in, their, in the Jewish documentation. So we'll move on here. So, and so, sawed in half is what the writer, what Paul suggests in the Epistle of Hebrews. Well, we've made it all the way to verse 2. Let's keep going here. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Little, per, little verse, but it turns out that there's a, a lot of... Uh, Implications here. Whenever you hear heavens and earth, we're reminded of Genesis 1-1. It's really an echo, if you will, of the creation itself. It really begins somewhat in the style of Deuteronomy 32, by the way, the Song of Moses. But the, uh, it's interesting that Isaiah is positioned midway between Moses, highly venerated in the Jewish community, of course, and the forthcoming messianic office of the Messiah, namely Jesus. He's right between the two, interestingly enough. And... Uh, so it, uh, all the way from here through verse 30, uh, 23, the chastening that's been visited upon the land and the time of the expulsion is near is, is focused on. This is detailed for you in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. And the renewal of the land covenant for future restoration is included in these passages also as we go here. Picking up the ISV before we go on, he says, Listen, you heavens, and let earth pay attention, because the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them to adulthood, but then they rebelled against me. So as you compare the ISV with the King James, it's no big surprise. Perhaps it reads a little smoother for our, our ear, I imagine. But I want you to notice something that the commentators seem to, uh, some don't pick up on here. They talk a lot about the fatherhood of God as being a New Testament concept. The fatherhood of God is right here where he says, I brought up children. See, the concept of God as our father is, is implicit in Isaiah's writing. But uh, we'll move on. And so, the, uh, I have nursed and brought up children, he says. So, the fatherhood of God is, uh, is, is fatherhood over his chosen people. And that actually is all through the Old Testament, much to the surprise of many people who have a different perspective from seminaries. So, uh, the, 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 this, this is the, f the first explicit occurrence of that idea is back in Exodus 4, verse 22. But... Uh, to assume this is restricted to the New Testament, I love this the way one commentator says, is to betray an ignorance of the facts, close quote. So that's a very polite way of putting it. The next verse is, The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, and my people doth not consider. And so it's interesting that he's drawing a contrast to even animals that are not exactly sagacious here. Uh, even the ox is not considered a very bright animal. But even he knows his owner, and an ass knows who feeds him. That's sort of, I mean, that, that in, Isaiah is using this sort of as a baseline, and yet Israel doesn't, hasn't figured out either one of those in regards to their owner, or their, the one that provides their food. And uh, one of the things that we'll touch on as we go is God's primary jealousy is his role as creator. And he has some specific judgments that he calls against those that fail to recognize him as creator. His role as redeemer you have to get from the word of God, but his role as creator, the creation itself, bears testimony. So we're without excuse. <laughs> 
Well, getting to the ISV, they said, the ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's feeding trough, but Israel doesn't know and my people don't understand. So it says, it captures the thing in a little more modern language perhaps. O oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. <laughs> okay, that's the uh, uh, and, uh, nation, oh, sinful nation. It's in the Hebrew, it's ha, hoi goi. There's a hoi, yeah, oi, we, oi ve, you know, oi. Goi is the is the, the, the nation, ethnos. And so uh, in, it, obviously this whole thing has a different flow in the, in the Hebrew. And, uh, so, but the Holy One of Israel is an interesting title. It's a very frequent title used by Isaiah uh, of the Lord and, and so forth. So let's say the ISV handles this a little differently. It says, Oh, you sinful nation, you people burdened down by iniquity, you offspring of those who keep practicing what is evil, you children who corrupt whatever they do, They've abandoned the Lord, they've despised the Holy One of Israel, in their estrangement they've walked away from me. And so that's the rendering there. And uh, so the, uh, the, the Masoretic text doesn't have the lack from me in there, but that's, uh, this captures it pretty well. Continuing verse 5, Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more, the whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. And uh, the ISV says, why will you be struck down? Will you continue to rebel? Your whole head is sick and your whole heart is faint. Now, so far the ISV, we throw it here to get a flavor of it. There are places where it's going to give a whole different percep perception. In this case here, it's just in a sense uh, putting the style from the King James a little more into the modern language. But it's doing it with a competence that is unique. We'll move on. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified um, with ointment. And uh, the ISV says, from the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there's no soundness evident, only bruises, sores, and festering wounds that haven't been cleaned out, bandaged, or treated with oil. So you get the flavor perhaps a little more clearly from the ISV, but it, there's no surprise. Continuing, your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land, strangers devour it in your presence and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers." So this is total destruction that's featured in Deuteronomy 29, Amos 9, and other passages. And so the ISV handles this with a subtitle, God's Diagnosis, Devastation. So it goes on, your country lies desolate, your cities have been incinerated before your very eyes. Foreigners are devouring your land, they've brought de devastation on it, while the land is overthrown by foreigners. So that makes it pretty direct. Uh, the, King James continues, And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. In the Hebrew, this is really a, a, a disastrous description. Uh, it's even quoted by Paul in Romans 9. See, mere outward religion is condemned. This is regarded as the most scathing indictment of religious formalism in Scripture. And there's a series of parallel passages you can look in your notes that are in your notes. I'll spare you that here. The ISV simply says, The daughter of Zion is left abandoned like a booth in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, or like a city under siege. So it sticks to the, to the language, but makes it perhaps a little clearer to our understanding. And uh, going ahead here, except the Lord of hosts hath left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like Gomorrah. That's pretty devastating. Now he's not speaking literally of Sodom and Gomorrah because that had happened long before. But uh, I if the Lord of the heavenly armies hadn't left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would be like Gomorrah. In other words, what he's focusing on is Sodom and Gomorrah were totally destroyed, never to be rebuilt. They weren't cities that had a bad time and then got rebuilt. No, they were wiped out permanently and uh, with no survivors. There's no Sodom and Gomorrah today. They're gone. And they're used idiomatically that way here. See, unless the, if, he ha if we didn't have a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, I'm, I'm reminded uh, <laughs> Billy Graham's f famous quip several decades ago. He said, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Incredible soundbite, and the, the point's there. 
Um, one of the most frequent questions we have to answer when we travel and answer, have question and answer periods in America, you know, why hasn't God judged America? Uh, because anyone that's spiritually sensitive realizes it's overdue. And the answer is that it probably has already started, so we'll move on here. Continuing in verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of your God, ye people of Gomorrah. See, he's maintaining the, that metaphor there, if you will. And uh, so, Sodom, of course, is simply here being used as a metaphor for Jerusalem. They're using Sodom and Gomorrah as metaphors for Jerusalem and, and, and Judah. Uh, we're going to see later in the book, they're going to use the Assyria and Babylon as metaphors for the enemies of God. And that's what John picks up in Revelation as mystery Babylon. Not the literal Babylon, but something uh, idiomatic. And we'll get to that later. But the ISV treats verse 10, Listen to what the Lord says, you rulers of Sodom, and pay attention to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Because he's going to get into here the whole idea of false worship. They're worshiping, but it's meaningless, so to speak. It continues here in verse 11 in the uh, King James. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed beasts. That I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. And the ISV picks this up uh, pretty much. How do your voluminous sacrifices benefit me, the Lord is asking. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I don't enjoy the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. So God is rejecting the formalism because their heart's not where it belongs. Verse 12, When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? And uh, so, the way I ask me handles it, when you come to present yourselves in my presence, who has required you to trample um, on my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I, can't, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Gets a little clumsy, probably, in the King James for us, our ears. The word abomination, of course, is an abominable image. And Revelation 13 really deals with the ultimate ones of those. But we go here. He says, stop, in the highest V, treats verse 13, stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me, as are your new moons, Sabbaths, and calling of convocations. I cannot stand iniquity within a solemn assembly. See, he says in verse 14, Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And the ISV treats it, As for your new moons and your appointed festivals, I abhor them. They've become a burden to me. I've grown weary of carrying that burden. This is God talking about sacrifice things that they thought were part of his ordinances. What's, what's wrong here? He continues, And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wow. Okay. The uh, ISV says, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I'll hide my eyes from you. Even though you pray repeatedly, I won't listen. Your hands are full of blood, your fingers drenched with iniquity. A little clearer. I give him credit, a little clearer. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. And this is an invitation to reconciliation. He says, wash yourselves and make yourselves clean, remove your evil behavior from my presence, stop practicing what is evil. Wow, okay, that's a, that is getting to specific uh, request here. Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. See, after the negative exhortation of the preceding verse, Isaiah now gives five positive exhortations, the first of which lays the foundation and groundwork for the remainder of them. Five positive ones here. The ISV says it's very simply, learn to practice what is good, seek justice, alleviate oppression, defend orphans in court, and plead the widow's case. That seems straightforward enough. Well, next we come to a very key verse in Isaiah. Verse 118, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, 
they shall be as wool. And uh, let's reason together. I mean, re let's reach an understanding. And you know, it's interesting that grace includes full amnesty. But uh, the ISV handles this uh, pretty much, pretty straightforward. Please come, let us reason together, implores the Lord. Even though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white like snow. Though they are like crimson, they'll become like wool. And so uh, King James, I find that actually easier, but that's, that's the, uh, the slice there. But there's more here that we want to talk about. This word crimson in the Hebrew happens to be the word tola. And tola turns out to be a very provocative allusion that Jesus himself uses of himself. And uh, when he hangs on the cross, as we have it recorded in Psalm 22, Jesus apparently says, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Strange remark, but here again he uses this strange word tola. Now the reason he's doing that, see the word tola in Hebrew can mean scarlet or crimson. It's tra translated crimson 38 times. But you see, scarlet dye was made from a particular worm, Sermus familial. And uh, it's an interesting allusion here. This Sermus uh, uh, vermilio pierces the thin bark of twigs to suck the sap, from which it prepares a waxy scale to protect its soft body. The red dye is in this scale. When reproducing, the female climbs a tree, usually the home or oak, where it bears its eggs, the larvae hatch and feed on the body of the worm. In other words, it gives its life for the young. And what's interesting, a crimson spot is left on the branch. When the scarlet spot dries out, in three days, it changes to white as it flakes off. What a provocative idiom we have here. In three days, how interesting that is to me. Yeah, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, it's interesting how the Lord uses such careful metaphors. Here he's using the metaphor of the worm to be both scarlet and points to this interesting biological model. It's interesting when he talks uh, in, his, in Matthew, Matthew 13, he talks about the pearl. The, the kingdom of heaven is like, like a pearl. Which, and and uh, the pearl is a strange metaphor for a Jew to use because they're not kosher. It's the only jewel that responds to an irritation and then grows by accretion and is removed from its place of growth to be an item of adornment. What a fabulous model of the church. So we, as we watch these metaphors, not only are they used consistently out through the scripture, but we find them with amazing insights that we can apply. So i pass that on as we go. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What a precious promise. Isaiah 118 is your memory verse for the evening. And we'll move on here. Now the reason I'm on this kick a little bit is because one of the things that bothers me is that most people don't know what the gospel is. You can go to churches and find out they don't preach the gospel. What is the gospel? That begs the question. What is the gospel? Paul tells us what it is in a very unique place. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ did three things. He died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried. And then he rose again the third day according to scripture. So that's the gospel. What's interesting to notice here, he doesn't, the gospel does not talk about his miracles, his teachings, his example, those are all great, don't misunderstand me. The gospel is how Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He didn't disappear, he died, most documented death on the planet Earth. And he didn't just die, he fulfilled hundreds of specific specifications, including his family tree and all kinds of other things. And that he was buried, only Paul emphasized that because he makes the thing about baptism later. And that he rose again the third day. Ah, see that's the key. That's, that's what all, 1 Corinthians 15 is all out. Without that, we have nothing. But there is something else here. He says that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And one of the, one of the challenges I, I, I suggest you take on is where in the Old Testament, that's what he's talking about, where in the Old Testament does it point to the, th the, the, th the third day? That he's going to be in the tomb three days. And if we get into that issue, where does it say that? Well, in four places at least. 
Jonah, of course, that's pretty straightforward. The Akedah in Genesis, in Genesis 22, Rahab's Korb, and the Tola Worm, which you just looked at. The Jonah thing is pretty well, we all think of that right away, because in Matthew 12, 40, Jesus points it out. He says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So that one's that, that's there's a, there's an allusion from the Old Testament that directly points to the tomb. Okay, great. The Akadi is a little more subtle. I won't try to develop it here, but if you remember the, the offering of Abraham, offering Isaac, he knew he was acting in a prophecy. And 2,000 years later, on that very spot, another father did offer his son as an offering for sin. So that's a whole study on its own, right? But, but uh, uh, Hebrews 11:19 points out that Isaac was dead to Abraham for the three days it took to get there. And, uh, but then we get to Rahab's court. This is one you probably haven't seen. I can't resist just sticking it in here for those that may not have seen this before. In the Joshua chapter 2, we have Rahab giving coverage for uh, 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 asylum, if you will, for the... Uh, the two spies that were there. And she let them down by a cord through the window for her house was upon the town wall, and she, for she dwelt upon the wall. So in other words, the two spies that she's been sheltering, she's going to lower out, let them sneak away, obviously. And uh, so the, when, she uses the, when she lets them down by a cord, she uses a Hebrew word, hebel. The word hebel can mean rope or cord, obviously, but it also is a word that can mean pain, sorrow, or travail. It's one of those words that has two meanings. Well, le- what, they d- what the two spies do, they re- re- reply to her a couple of verses later and say, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father, thy mother, thy brethren, and thy f- all thy father's household home unto thee. What they say is, you've taken care of us. When we attack Jericho, you put this cord out there and our troops will protect the p- you and your family that you won't be injured as we, as we uh, level the place. And so, uh, fair enough. That's not what makes it. But something interesting, when they refer to the line of scarlet thread, they don't use the word hebel. They take a word, different word. Another word, it's tikva, which can mean line or cord, but it's another one of these words that has two meanings. It also can mean hope or expectation. In fact, the national anthem of Israel is ha tikva, the hope. Okay. Well, what's interesting about this little passage is between those two pa- uh, verses, she gives them, when she tells them she's going to let them out the window, she said to them, get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may ye go your way. So she's advising them, don't go straight back to your camp, go up in the mountains and hide until the search is over, then go back to your people. A strategy, which they follow. The question is, why did she happen to say three days? I don't think she knew. I think the Holy Spirit was in charge here. She didn't say two days or four days. She said three. What's that got to do with thing? Let's examine the text and see what the Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit frequently diddles with the text, I've discovered. Let's see what he's doing here. Hebel can mean a rope or cord. Tikva can mean... But see, they each... Each of these can mean a rope or cord, but each of these words are a pun and can mean something different. They can mean, in the one case, pain, sorrow, or travail. In the other case, hope and expectation. And we understand that the, the ultimate pain and travel is the cross. The ultimate hope is the empty tomb. And how much space is between Hebel and Tikva? Three days between the cross and our empty tomb. You see, now many of you will say, Chuck, you're making something out of nothing. Maybe. I don't think so. I just stand back in awe and realize that this is God-breathed. The text is God-breathed. And uh, there are subtleties here that will surface if we're diligent. So I challenge you with that one. And so for what it's worth. I said there are four. Of course, the fourth one is the Tola worm, which introduced me to this little side trip. Uh, but I couldn't resist it, so we'll return to the text. The, from ch- verses 19 through 31, the rest of this chapter, is all about entreaty and warning. And I want to point out, as we go, the failure of Judah and Israel is eclipsed, in a sense, by the failure of the church, which is greater than that of Jerusalem, because the church has had greater light. 
So before we get too critical, as, as, as Isaiah rails against Judah and Jerusalem, let's recognize that we're eligible for the same kind of entreaty and warning. Verse 19, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Or in the eyes of fever, we are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land produced. Okay, that's fair enough. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Or in the eyes of fever, but if ye refuse and rebel, ye will be devoured by the sword, because the Lord hath spoken. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, no surprises. In the uh, uh, King James, how, how is the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Boy, how much it's fallen, right? The word harlot's a strong term, but used this way, not only here, but throughout uh, Hosea and other places. And the ISV handles this, how the faithful city has become a whore. She is used to be filled with justice. Righteousness used to reside within her, but now only murderers live there. So the ISV perhaps makes it a little more crisp in our perceptions. Thy silver has become dross, thy wine mixed with water. And silver, of course, is the, the emblem of redemption. Here it says, your silver has become dross, and your best wine is diluted with water. Continuing, thy princes are rebellious, companions of thieves. Every one loveth gifts, and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. What Isaiah is saying here, he's, and he now gives the explanation for the figures of speech he's employed. Since the corruption of the nation generally begins with its rulers, Isaiah singles these out for denunciation. That's how tragic it is when the rulers of a land are corrupt. The ISV says, Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. All of them are lovers of bribes and are runners after gifts. They do not bring justice to the orphans, or the widow's case never comes up for their review in their court. So that's the way they summarize it there. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. Quite a verse, but notice a subtlety here. Notice the three titles. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Are those just synonyms or are they three titles? I'll leave it up to you to judge. I think there's three titles tucked away there. The ISV says, Therefore this is what the Lord God of the Heavenly Fathers, the one who is Israel's mighty one, declares, Now I'll get relief from his enemies and avenge myself on his foes. So they don't, uh, they don't see it quite the way I do, but that's, they're probably obviously much, much more competent, so we'll move on. And I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. Well, the, the dross is mentioned in Ezekiel 22, but we will get it here. I turn my attention to you. I'll refine your dross as a furnace, as in a furnace. Let me remove all your alloy, which is the, what was the role the tin played. Move on here. And I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. So here's the ray of hope at the end of the tunnel, if you will. The judges are to be restored at the future kingdom. That's what Matthew 19 also talks about. The ISV treats it this way, Let me restore your judges at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward you will be called the righteous city and the faithful city of Zion. And, uh, okay. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment, and her converts with righteousness. And uh, I, pretty much the same thing that ISV sees it pretty much the same way. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together, and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. Rebels and sinners will be broken together, but those who forsake the Lord will be consumed. The ISV echoes. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which ye have desired, and ye shall be confounded for the gardens that ye have chosen. And you, if you want to duck, dig into trees and gardens, especially as idioms, I'll let you track those down at your own leisure. The ISV simply says, You'll be ashamed of the oak trees that you desire, you blush because of the gardens that you have chosen. <laughs> For ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water. And, uh, or you'll be like an oak whose leaf is withering, and like an unwatered garden. And uh, so, and the last verse here is, And the strong shall be as tow, 
and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. Now, if you stumble through that in the King James, you, you, you run the risk of missing the point here. This term tow is not familiar to most of us. Uh, tow is the coarse part of the flax or hemp that's shaken off when the, fa- when the flax, when it's beaten. And so that's what, uh, that's what tow really means. It's a strand of flax shaken from the flax. So the way the ISV treats this, just to cut through all that, your strong one will be like tinder, and your work as a spark. Both of them will burn together with no one to quench the flames that burn them. Oh, that's a little clearer, isn't it? This is one of those places where the, the uh, ISV certainly cuts through the, some of the confusion. And uh, your strong one will be like tinder and your work like a spark. Both of them will burn together with no one, with no one to qu- quench the films that burn them. So here's probably, a, this is a place where it does seem a little helpful there. There's going to be other places that going to be quite profound. We'll leave it there for there. But there's a broader relevance lurking behind all of this. God has called a special people to represent Him. And uh, they had become an apostate and failed. The enemies of God will be represented by Assyria and Babylon here. And Babylon, of course, is a type, a symbol of the hostile opposition of God's people. And uh, the harmony and the resonance of this book, will it'll resonate with Revelation and Patmos. The revelation with Patmos will be astonishing. God's judgments and ultimate restoration are depicted and surprisingly relevant to God's people today. You're going to discover as we go into this, it's going to have uh, uh, relevance to all of us. To remind you again of the design of the book, we're in Division 1, which is the first 35 chapters, and we're in the first group of six, and uh, they'll be followed with Israel. Then we're going to get into all the nations, Babylon, Philistia, Moab, Syria, Egypt, Edom, Arabia, and Tyre, and there'll be surprises in each of those. And then we have the day of the Lord. That's, boy, there's a lot of uh, confusion about what is that really, and we'll get into all of that then. And then the six woes upon Jerusalem, and then, of course, the tribulation. And that'll be the first major section of this book. For the next session, um, is I'd like you to prepare for the next session by reading chapters 2 through 5. We'll take that as a group. We'll pick up the sp- pace here a little bit. We'll see the promise of the last days. We'll see the vision of the future kingdom. And um, the parable of Yodhevave's vineyard. Very interesting parable that Jesus draws upon. And we'll talk about the six woes. And we'll discover those six woes are manifest upon us all. So it's going to be, suddenly it's going to get very, very, very deeper, but also very timely for all of us. And so with that, let's bow our hearts for a closing word of prayer.